Welcome to our continued discussion on mega themes. Uh, this one, we're going to take a look at demographics, which includes aging, ethnicity, and racism. We're going to take a look at globalization. Um, we are all interconnected. Climate change. Then we're going to take a little look at disruption and innovation, uh, both digitalization and artificial intelligence. Let's start with demographics. Um, right now, if we're looking at that, we're seeing some big demographic shifts, okay? Uh, we can see here, this is the developed countries. These are developing countries. So if what we can see is we're seeing an increase in these developing countries. The US and Europe and Japan are developed countries. So what we're seeing is that over time, the population is changing. And right now we're at about 7 billion people. Uh, but as you can tell, those in the developing countries are growing faster than in developed countries. Um, what we're seeing, uh, look at the size of these countries. Some of them are huge. The U.S. is down here at 4.2%. Um, so when we're looking at some of these things, uh, when we look at the growth in Nigeria, Indonesia, Pakistan, um, they're very big. So. India, 17%, 18%. These are huge numbers. We're a small percentage of the world's population. And if we look at the projections um, in 2100, um, the share of the world population will be up to 11.2 billion. But look at where it is. It's in Asia, in Africa. Um, it's not in North America. It's not in Europe. Um, it's in Africa and Asia. Um, so that becomes important for us as we're looking at where opportunities are in the world. The opportunities are outside the U.S. And that has a lot of implications. How we do business, how we engage with people, how do we sell in those countries. So a lot of this all ties together. Um, the one thing that we've seen is on a periodic basis, if you look over time, the U.S. population has actually been growing, okay? And when we look at it, um, we have a declining birth rate and the growth from census to census isn't there. Um, the average American today has 17% fewer children than in 1990 and about 50% fewer than 1960. We're still more fertile than Japan and Germany, but it's in the same range, okay? There are now more Americans over 80 than under two years. If we look at the population growth, we can see it. It may not look like a lot, but the growth has slowed. If we're looking at this chart from 2010 to 2020 by year, we're seeing the U.S. population sl growing slower than it has in the past. When we look at this, we look at age 16 to 24, 25 to 54, 55 to 64, and then 65 and over. If we look at where we are in 2000, 2019, and 2025, we're seeing some significant shifts here. And that becomes important for us to understand what does that mean? What are the implications of that? Um, when we find, well, here's something that when we look at this, American age 20 to 64, okay, annual increase, they're growing, they're, they're declining. So we're seeing much slower growth, and this is our prime working group. But look at how much the 65 years and older are growing. So where we've always had um, more Americans age 20 to 64, we're seeing it change. The opposite is happening. We're not, we're not growing as fast in the prime working. And this will come into play in a lot of different ways, both in financial statement analysis and in organizational behavior. Um, when we look at the working age population um, and we see the growth between um, high income company, countries, that's us, the US, China, China's also declining, um, but we're going to see the working age population around the world change. Okay. 
Um, when we look at it on Americans, um, we're going to see, um, again, here, 2030, not that far away, we'll go from 15 to 21 percent. Um, working, those in the working age group, declining. Okay. Now, if you're living longer, you may have higher medical costs. You may stay in the workforce longer, second and 30, third careers, part-time or gig workers, um, different lifestyles and buying habits as people age, they change. And this is resulting in the decline in the workforce um, in the U.S. and in developed countries. Um, and again, we see this uh, little graph here again as to the labor force participation rate. And we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to labor. But if you're looking here, is there's a decline, okay? So we're seeing this decline in workforce, meaning those people that are in the workforce want to be in the workforce, either employed or looking for work. And what we're seeing is this decline, if we were taking trends and putting it, but what's happened, some of, some of this pandemic here, but the participation rate has been declining. Less people are in the workforce, aging. Um, when we look around the world, um, we can see that the median age is 30, with 9% of the population over 65. But when we look, that's the world. Now take a look here in Japan, 47 and 28. In the U.S., 38 and 16. If we just go back here, uh, where that's heading, it's getting bigger every year and will continue to. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the population makeup in the U.S. has changed. Um, when we look at the this by, um, by race, um, we clearly see that the percentage of those that are white are, are getting smaller because we were up here and now it's getting lower. The real growth we're seeing is in the Hispanic population. Um, so that is in important that we're seeing this changing makeup of the U.S. And one of the things I, I think that we'll look at a, a bit is we have the, it started with the Black Lives Matter, but it's really helped us identify this concept called systemic racism. And I think we look at the college wants to be an anti-racist college. Um, and I think it goes through, if we look at the circle, we're in different zones. The first one is the fear zone. We don't want to talk about it, okay? It's not a real problem. Race, this is 2021, race doesn't mean a difference. You don't ask hard questions. Um, you tend to talk to others who look and think like you. We then move into the learning zone, if you will, where you can recognize racism is a present and current problem. I seek out questions that make me feel uncomfortable. I'll be sharing some of them with you as we go forward. Um, I understand my own privilege as a white male uh, in ignoring it. Um, I, I educate myself. I've been spending a lot more time in thinking about this, and I took a class, Advanced Cultural Competency, which really helped me learn more about it. We'll do an activity in organizational behavior around this. Um, then you move to the growth zone. Um, is you can, you're comfortable with your discomfort. Okay, if that makes sense. Um, I talk about it, how racism hurts our society. Um, I surround my others that look different than me. And, and I've been doing this over the past two years. It really, since COVID, has uh, made me learn, question. Um, and I promote activity. You can promote act and advocate for policies um, that are anti-racist um, and know how you may benefit. So I think this is a, a, a topic that'll be with us, but we're changing, all this is part of this changing society, especially as we're aging and the ethnicity and race is changing. Next piece, the world is interconnected, okay? Yeah, you can't just be isolated in the U.S. We talk to people all over. We're more independent and interlocked today than we have ever 
We're 24% of the economy, but only 4%, 5% of the population. Now, where this comes into play, and we have heard this, this has been really a big piece of the news, is supply chain. Something that we probably would have never talked about. But you got to think about this is there's both an upstream supply chain and a downstream. Downstream, you start with the supplier of inputs. For example, food. You go to farmers, processors, wholesalers, retailers, consumers. Okay, and then it repeats it going back up from information. Okay, um, and we're looking at this. This is the global piece. This happens all over the world. Uh, when we look at food, uh, where our foods come from, uh, you can see from this chart, they're all over. And that can come from genetic resources, to seeds, to ability to produce things. Food has got us connected. This is an example of the Boeing 787. Where do the parts come from? Different companies. But look at where the different parts come from to make it all over the world. We've seen the supply chain as a reason why things aren't available. But we keep looking at big companies. Let's take a look at big companies. Where does revenue for the 500 largest American companies come from? 70% comes from the U.S., but 30% comes from outside the U.S. We were to update this today, we're going to find that the U.S. accounts for a smaller percentage of revenue in our biggest 500 companies than before. So we're going to see this is changing as American companies are growing. They're growing outside the U.S. So this is a market and opportunities. Uh, when we look at the same thing as employees, we see a similar number that we're, the number of people working outside the U.S. is increasing and is a substantial percentage of the total workers of our large companies. And if we go back, there's been this reallocation, if you will, if you think about this over a historical period of time, um, it started in, we, we have manufactured, everything used to be manufactured here in the U.S. We got everything in the U.S. Then new labor forces came into play. Eastern Europe, like in 1989, when the Eastern, when the, the when we had the opening of some of the former pieces of the Soviet Union in Poland and Hungary, um, new workforce. So what we had is manufacturing capacity moved out of the U.S. into Eastern Europe. Then we had in 1997 is when China really opened up, okay, not that long ago, and became part of the World Trade Organization in 2002. We have Vietnam and Malaysia opening up now in Indonesia. So as new workforces become available, businesses seek out the lower cost labor. If we look at the cost of making something in Germany, it's $42 an hour. $37 in the U.S., but if we drop down to Mexico, it's $5.90. It can even go cheaper in India. Now, think about this from a business perspective. Go back to your basic accounting. Debits equal credits. Revenues less cost equals profit. Cash in, less cash out. There's three options. Cash exceeds, cash in exceeds cab, cash out. You got a surplus, you made money. Cash in equals cash out, it's balanced. Cash in is less than cash out, you have a deficit. Where does cash come from? It comes from sales. Now, if you can move production to a lower cost location, what happens is you have less cash going out and we're having a surplus. So this is some of the driving forces behind that as we open it up. Now, what we're seeing though is that costs are rising significantly over the past five years. We're seeing costs in China go up, Mexico go up, Vietnam, but Vietnam is still in Mexico is cheaper than China. Okay, 
So we got these cost equations are going on here. The global financial system is integrated. Currencies, banking, financial markets, uh, governments, central banks, investment banks, we're all tied together globally. So let's take a break now and uh, come back in a few minutes.